This episode of Fermented Adventure the Podcast is sponsored by Brewskits, handcrafted dog treats made from spent beer grains, oats, barley, and rye, no chemical preservatives, a great source of fiber, and packed with protein. Visit brewskits.com to see the full selection of treats for your dog and your cat. Receive 15% off, no minimum purchase, on your first order by typing in lowercase FA2024 at checkout. Cheers! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, craft spirit enthusiasts, and those interested in the intoxicating world of craft distilleries, cideries, meaderies, wineries, and the occasional foray into breweries. It's Rich Sheen, and welcome to Fermented Adventure, the podcast, where we bring you the fascinating people that are making the mash, fermenting, distilling, bottling, pouring, and delivering to you some of the finest libations in the world. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. Thank you for bringing the podcast into wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We truly are grateful that you've chosen to listen and make us part of your day. It would mean the world to us if you left a five-star review. This helps us climb in the rankings, and it makes it easier for others to find us. Don't hesitate to leave us your comments as well. If the podcast didn't meet your expectations, tell us why. We're always striving to improve. You can find us at fermentedadventure.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Fermented Adventure. Email us at fermentedadventure at gmail.com. All right, FA Nation, let's meet our guest. He's Drew Mabel. I'm Rich Shane. Dawn Ranieri's here. And this is Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Drew Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. So much energy here. How did you find your way into the spirits world? That's a really good question because um, when I was looking for work back a long time ago, uh, I actually where I grew up, there was two places I wanted to work and I applied to both. One was a brewery and one was a distillery. And that distillery was Seagram Distillery. And obviously, this, as you know, I worked for Seagram, so I picked the, the distillery, which I probably, in hindsight, probably was the best move because there was so much more to learn there and uh, so much more excitement. And that's where I went and I worked in the distillery and I wanted to work in the lab. So that's where I started the lab distillery lab. And that was really the uh, the best place to work in the entire distillery and I was actually there for only about a year and a half and they were looking for someone to go over to the bottling area and they looked for volunteers and nobody would volunteer because everybody wanted to live and die in the distillery. That was the best place. So they said, well, the youngest person's going to go over to the bottling and quality area. And that was me. And they said, you're going over. <laughs> Not much choice, but it was the best move ever because that's where I learned how to taste. And that's, you have your hands on with Tasting uh, incoming material uh, like spirits, uh, maturates, you know, after they're done maturing, making the different products, the quality of bottling, you know, packaging, all that. And that really got me interested in a whole new area of uh, Seagram's. And that's that's really changed my life because that's where I became the master blender for Seagram after so many years. At the time, did you recognize the value of in, in a way, your first starting job, the internship that you went through that gave you this path to where you are today? Well, at the time, I had no idea. No, not in a million years I would have ever predicted that because you always wanted to work in the lab. That's what, what my intent was to be more science oriented in the lab and do testing and stuff like that. And never did I thought I would be into the, the master blender role ever. And to, not, not at that time anyways. And then, you know, it was really exploring because you really had this whole opportunity to learn about how a distillery works from head to toe, basically. And that was really the uh, best move I ever could have made. Do you remember some of your mentors or some yeah. names that you recall that gave you that start and impacted you? Well, probably the biggest is Art Daw, and he was the uh, master blender for uh, Seagram at the time for uh, North America. And he was, we, we called him the Nose. Um, that was his nickname, but he really is the one who nurtured my career because he saw possibilities in me over, over the years. And he actually moved us from where we were there to, uh, Montreal. And, uh, that's where I started mentoring more with him. So he was probably the biggest influence 
in my career by believing in me and then also mentoring me over the years. And it's kind of nice because now it's come full circle and with our distillery in Montreal, he's been there. He's part of our welcome video for, for uh, customers because he helped me so much. And also we have the tie-in with Montreal with Sam Bronfman. And as a matter of fact, we have a product called Mr. Sam, which is a tribute whiskey to uh, Sam Bronfman, which ties in my Seagram background and him. And he has a quote in that little book that comes with the bottle, and I do in the book in the bottle. So it's come full circle back to my roots. You mentioned Mr. Nose, the nose, the nose, the the nose. Yes. I'm curious for you, like certain celebrities have things insured. (laughs) No, I don't. (laughs) <laughs> but how do you keep your I mean we've come out of 4 years of this covid right where I can say I've not lost my sense of taste and sense of smell and I believe that I have a good palate and I have a good nose but for you how do you keep that in shape or how do you guard against the desensitizing especially through a long day of tasting or nosing or blending that you do yeah so when we uh the best way for me, and it may be more individualistic, is uh, I take breaks. Since my office and tasting is near very close, you can taste products, whiskeys, single barrels, whatever you're working on, and then you can go back in your office and do things there. So you can take breaks. You know, some people will use water to to neutralize the palate, but you, you at some point you get exhausted, so you just don't. You just can't smell and taste. And, you know, even uh, over the years, we've done tests on how long you can sustain that. But it's very individual, you know, depends on the person. So sometimes, in the, my experience, if you look at, say, more than 20, 30, you, even, you, can, you can look up to 40 samples and still be sensitive to it. Uh, but it depends on the individual. But for me, it's the, it's the time of day I take and, and look at samples Usually for me, it works better in the mornings when you're very sensitive. Uh, in the afternoons, I think you become more lethargic and you, you're not as, uh, I think, not as good as you are early morning. But for me personally, as you get older, you start losing some of that too, your sense of taste and your smell. So what I've been doing to try and offset that natural progression is, um, is reducing my salt intake. And so that, I think, is helping me a lot because it, I think salt kind of enhances flavors and when you're eating with food and it really desensitizes your palate. So now I find that has helped me over the years. But the other thing is probably more than anything is hereditary because my mother was very sensitive even to the day she died. She could smell things miles away and really had a sensitive uh, sense of smell. And it was amazing she could pick that up even in her 90s. So I think that's part of it, too, is hereditary. You mentioned the reduction of salt. Are there things that do you come into the morning with a clean palate? Do you stop off for a coffee? Anything that you're having before you start tasting? No, generally it might be a coffee. But uh, other than that, no, not too much. Because I find uh, it'll, it'll distract you pretty closely. So... Some people, uh, and I've worked with some professionals who who drink coffee and smell coffee to neutralize their palate. So that works for them. And I think you need to find out what works for you as an individual, just like what product you like in terms of taste. I think it's very, it's up to the individual. But me, I don't mind having coffee and it does neutralize. But sometimes I even take a sample of vodka and just cleanse the palate and I smell and that cleanses your uh, nasal passages. And so you can smell something. I think it's more in tune with what you're smelling afterwards. So I think it's a really uh, a good way to neutralize my palate and my nose. What interests you most about the creation of bourbon? Um, probably the, uh, the mystery of creating bourbon. Um, if you look at a distillate, white dog it is it's not pleasurable to most people there are people who do like it but the mystery what happens from that point 
through the aging process and what you get at the final product. It's to me, it's always been amazing that mystery part of bourbon and whiskeys. You're the blender. You're the master blender. You work with Harlan Wheatley, the master distiller. What's that relationship like? Because he's on the assembly line, so to speak, creating the car. You're putting that car together after it's delivered and you're driving it out and around the track and that car has to perform. What are those conversations together about where you'd like to reach or the things that are being distilled and produced and giving you the opportunity as a master blender to offer the best product possible in each different category and expression? Well, our, our relationship is probably, I would term it as excellent. I mean, it's, you know, when we didn't release our George T. Stagg in 2021, it was a mutual decision between the two of us. So we have mutual respect. And as soon as we go to the senior management and tell them this, it was not accepted. So it, we're trusted too. So that relationship is really good. And one thing, excuse me, Harlan has done over the years, which I don't think he gets enough credit for, is improving the consistency. Because a lot of distillers don't think about that as much as Harlan. But Harlan actually has reduced the, the, the defects or the variability immensely through his you know, a science approach where, you know, you use gauges and methodologies like that to ensure the consistency because things do vary all the time, whether it be the crop of corn that you're using, whether it be your uh, process that has a lot of variability. So he's narrowed that variability down. So the things that I have to worry about are a lot less because when I first joined, there would be more a lot of rejects that didn't match the taste profile. When I say rejects, they're not bad throw away, just don't match the taste profile. So inconsistency. And so when he took over, that inconsistency has dwindled down to almost nothing now. So he, you know, he's really done a really good job at that. But our relationship has been excellent. And um, I, maybe, I, maybe I should expand a little bit about what we what we work together on is more about the future of bourbon, the future of whiskey. And Buffalo Trace, I don't know if it has a reputation or not, but we really try to uh, make a better whiskey. Our objective is not just to make great whiskey, but it's to make tomorrow's whiskey, tomorrow's bourbon, a better whiskey, a better bourbon. So we spend a lot of time looking at experiments and how we can do that. And so I think really... Uh, you know, you could go on and on about experimentation at Buffalo Trace because we spent a lot of effort and time doing that. And is it, it, it's really part of our culture. I don't know the best way to describe it. And the president of the company and the CEO was always involved with that process. And he actually, at the beginning, was leading it. And now Har Harlan leads that process of experimentation and making better whiskey but we have countless experiments that we have done and we have countless experiments that we want to do and we have to be disciplined on what we do because there's just too many to do and with the purpose of making not only new products but better products and you know probably the best example i can give is our uh, eh taylor four grain that we released I think it was named best whiskey in the world. And that was an experiment. So that was the idea. That's our mandate. The, actually, the motto of the distillery is honor tradition, embrace change. So even though you're honoring the traditional methods, we want to embrace change for tomorrow and make better products. And so that's what um, the four grain did is we did this experiment. It turned out to be great. Unfortunately, when you do experiments, there's only so much made. And so it was gone right away, basically. And you could still see it online, people really trying to get it. We still have some bottles at, in my lab. And it tastes pretty good. Um, but anyways, that's what we want to do. But I don't want to mislead you in any way that our experiments are always like that because we fail a lot of experiments and some of the ones we fail we stamp we put them in a bottle and stamp failed on the front label because we fail more than we succeed um, but that's I think the purpose of experimentation and 
you know, we do a lot of interesting things. We try to, you know, people have an obsession with older products. So we're, we're exploring that, you know, how long can we age a product and what can we do uh, to make it age 50, maybe even 100 years. Um, even though you don't need that to be a great product, you know, our, some of our products are young and they win many, many different awards. So that's really exciting from a blender, from a, a distiller point of view, is that whole future of bourbon and whiskey and what we make at Buffalo Trace. And it's not even, I keep talking, it's not even um, just Buffalo Trace now because we have distilleries all over the world. And all those distilleries are part of our discussions now. So they're all doing things too. You probably haven't heard about what they're doing, but they're all doing things and we're feeding off each other and trying to almost compete to make different things, better things. Um, and so eventually we'll have a whole stream of, you know, potentially better products out there from all our distilleries, no matter where the, if, if it's in Ireland, uh, France or uh, Canada, we have a lot of good products coming through now that you haven't even heard about. See, that's the exciting part as a consumer. And the hard part is you make that great consistent product, the Buffalo right. Trace product, the EH. I mean, you're, you're, you're producing that consistent yes. expression, but the consumer is always coming to you and saying, hey, Drew, what's next? What's more? What do you got in the lab? What's happening? And a lot of times, don't you want to just say, aren't you happy with me right now? <laughs> no, because uh, we're the same way because we want something more. Uh, and that's the exciting part for us too, like I said. Uh, so, you know, we, we usually don't talk about what we're doing to anybody uh, because we don't want to, you know, people are, they have their ways of finding out what we're doing. You know, they look at these label approval things and all that because they know what's coming down the pike. And that's, you know, they know before even some of the Sazerac people know because they read these things and they follow them. But, you know, we, we've just released our peated bourbon experiment uh, recently. You know, we've got others coming down, but we, we want to try different things. And the experimentation part is really the fun part for us, is especially the consistent C part I've been doing for over 40 years. And that's extremely important. Buffalo Trace needs to taste the same as it did 20 years ago when it was first introduced. But the fun part for us is doing all these different things and making, trying to make it better or new, something new. Brewskits, beer, grain, dog, bones, brewskits. Your dog will go wild, brewskits. Beer, grain, dog, bones, a healthy alternative for your pup. Brewskits are all natural and made in the USA. Visit brewskit.com. That's B-R-E-W-S-C-U-I-T.com. Drew, you've said consistency a couple times. Huh? And Buffalo Trace has gone through an expansion. You've got new that is about yes. a year old now with the new still. And how do you keep that consistency? How have the process has been to say, all right, this is exactly what we're supposed to have come off the still, any tweaking and stuff like that. Is that is that something that, you know, as you've gotten this thing started and now where it is, are you seeing that fall back into place where it should be? Yeah, so we, we it's a good question because uh, that's always a concern that you have a different product after you put something new in. So Harlan meticulously designed it to match his other stills. So the process even though it's new, it isn't new because it's the same process up until that point. You're, so you're grinding, you're fermenting, the, the fermenters are the same, you know, a lot of consistency in terms of the design. Uh, but then, you know, you have new warehouses and that you have to design them. So he designed them after the same temperature variations of some of our other warehouses, the main ones that we've been using for many years. So we're monitoring that as it was aging and tasting it as it was aging. Then we also have some uh, analytical data that we use. We have gas chromatograph uh, that actually measures some of the chemical constituents that are part of that and you watch and monitor that over time. So we've got a lot of eyes on it and we're looking at it. And even if we don't find, uh, say, it's a 100% match, but I think it will be, I think it will be uh, right on because what I see so far, uh, a blender can take care of some of that. So you actually, 
will marry different flavors from different places to average out those differences. So there's ways around these things, even if it doesn't work in your game plan. But I think we put a lot of effort into the game plan, so I think we'll be successful. With so many barrels, yeah, lots of barrels to keep track of, and as you said, so many ways to test and monitor. In your mind, and this is where I I love this conversation because you know what these expressions are supposed to be tasting like. You yeah. know what they're supposed to nose, and and you're the you're the lab. You're you're the mad scientist in a way to say, all right, that's a little off, but you know exactly which Rick House. You know which barrel era you you know this. I mean, but but having that that resource or that catalog in your head of what this is supposed to taste like and knowing where to go. I mean, to me that's fascinating as to what you do all the time. That you know Coke is supposed to taste like Coke, Buffalo Trace is supposed to taste like Buffalo Trace, Blanton's is supposed to taste like Blanton's, and you know where to go all the time for these things? Yeah, well, it's just not me. It's in combination with the warehouse. And so they we have a, like a warehouse manager who knows a lot of the typical places and has a catalog of where typically some of these products are made. Because we don't rotate our barrels. We keep them where they are because that's how we differentiate some products. Even if it's the same mash bill, if it's aged at the top versus the bottom, it's going to be totally different in terms of uh, taste profile. So we have lots of experience on that and we have over 40 almost 50 different whiskeys at buffalo trace you know bourbons and uh, other products so we we really have to be good at that and so i think we've gotten over the years pretty good like the best example i can give you is is elmer t lee uh it's very hard to get and people love it and elmer when we taste it uh together he would he would always prefer a style of whiskey, and that tends to be fruitier, uh, even though it's almost 10 years old, fruitier and softer and easy to drink like that. So he preferred that style of whiskey. So if you look at Elmer, you'll taste that style in, in, the, in that product. Now, I think that's why a lot of people like it. But at the same time, if you take uh, Eagle Rare, which is aged a little more, just a little bit, it's got more oak and more wood, so we know where those barrels are of Elmer versus uh, Eagle Rare. So it really is important where you get the barrels. And then we have lots of checks and balances. So e Eagle Rare safe versus Elmer. Elmer, we have a standard that we approve, and uh, Eagle Rare has a standard. So if we get barrels of... Uh, Eagle Rare, instead of Elmer come down and we have Elmer Standard, we'll see the difference right away. We'll know those barrels are not good for that and we'll, we'll get them from somewhere else. So there's lots of checks and balances too. Not just that institutional knowledge, but also through the testing process that we go through, which is very important too. Is there, is there a whiskey or an expression that you think doesn't get the recognition it should, maybe a little underrated, that you'd like to see more love paid to? Hmm. Probably. Actually, it's getting more recognition now. So Benchmark is our entry level of bourbon, which is the same mash bill as Buffalo Trace. And it never used to get the recognition of being a... A, a great whiskey but I think more and more people are tasting it because we have different expressions now people are appreciating the quality of that whiskey and then the other one that comes to mind is our Sazerac rye a lot of people don't like straight rye whiskeys you either like them or you don't but once people taste them they say well that's not too bad so it never got the recognition and then if you take that same product or close to that same product and you you don't filter it or you don't add water to then you have a product called thomas handy and so that wins awards all over the world so just the sazerac rye the base whiskey doesn't get the recognition but the buffalo trace antique collection version uncut unfiltered does and it goes same with the other products like um, benchmark like i said versus the same mash bill as george t stag after so many years so the younger version, because everybody wants the 
Buffalo Trace antique collection, all the ex beautiful expressions that we have. But they don't realize that the versions below those are the same whiskey, just not aged as long. So they're very high quality whiskeys. So they don't get really that recognition either. But I think we get pretty good recognition overall, though, these days, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, across the world, we got a lot of work to do yet. And I think that's one of the bright spots of Sazerac is that we haven't fully tapped the potential around the globe. Pardon the interruption. Thank you so much for listening to Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Could you do us a favor? Hit that follow button. It makes it easier for others to find us and it helps us climb in the rankings. Take a screenshot of the podcast, post it, tag us, and let everyone know that you listen to the Fermented Adventure podcast. Now, back to our podcast. You mentioned Sazerac Rye. Yes. And you talk rye and... We're here in New Jersey, which is adjacent to PA, and we got Maryland and Virginia and New York and great historical rye states and rye producers. Do you see, or where do you see the emergence of rye? And is that something that you either find you are on pace to keep up with, you're behind, or you're looking to set the pace in the future with things you have in the rickhouses and barrel warehouses? Well, I always think rye has a potential. It's it's great for making a Sazerac rye, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just, you got to really like it, like that spiciness, that pepperiness. And not everybody likes that. Uh, so that's holding it back, I think, a little bit. Uh, but it does make great cocktails because of that. So it's kind of a mixed bag there. Um, probably one of the best products that we don't make that nobody has tasted except me is our uh you know our sazerac 18 year old but uncut unfiltered so if people were to taste that type of product they would just fall in love with rye so there's so much more we can do in the future it's just a matter of time and having the product available we don't have enough to sell now as the regular but there's some products there that are fantastic that people haven't tasted yet it's quiet. There are no tours. It's just you and the complex. You're in your lab or you're walking through one of the Rick houses. Take us to that moment. I mean, what does that feel like for you? Well, when you, uh, <laughs> if you, if you walk through the distillery, it's got that sense of heritage and tradition. I mean, it, you, I, even visitors for the first time feel that. So it doesn't feel industrial at all. It feels homey. It feels like there's history there, which there is since the 1770s. We've been distilling there. Um, but in the lab, it's like you do... Usually I do go in quite early and uh, there's nobody there. So you really have time to think. And, you know, as you're testing and tasting, and you do think about what's come before you, you know, uh, but also what can come ahead of you, like what's coming down the pike. And I really, I, it brought me back, that's why I chuckled a minute ago, is in the lab uh, that I used to be um, prior to the lab, the physical location at Buffalo Trace, we moved about six years ago, used to be, um, at night you could hear uh, the table, like if you were in one part of the lab, you could hear a table that has glasses on clinging. And you would think, gee, what's that? I mean, like ghosts, like that's kind of that heritage that I'm talking about. They're there, they're watching us. And uh, I haven't seen anything, but that's what you think about is that history and heritage that's there. The people have gone before you. Some of the products we made when I first came were, I, I never was involved with them, it was people prior to us. And so we have a lot of respect for that. And also the stuff we're working on now probably won't be drank until after we're gone. So you think about that a little bit. So you got a sense of uh, being uh, working there, let me tell you. Is it perhaps the buffalo creating the trace coming through the area, the ghosts of those buffalo creating that trace, perhaps? I don't know. Well, I think it's the ghosts of the people prior to us. Okay. And and we've had, um, we've had the ghost hunters on our property to check for the ghosts, because there's ghosts. That's what they tell us. There was a show, The Ghost Hunters. I don't know if you've heard of it. 
Dawn Dawn can do that yeah. and as we've been walk as we've taken the tour, we've we've you know, yes. what do you feel? What do you see? Because as you said, a lot of people have walked through those grounds uh -huh. and have occupied those spaces and left a legacy. You talk about creating for the future, you're laying down barrels and yeah. you're coming up with these products that will outlast you and me and yes. but but what do you see at the end for where you say, all right, I've done all I can do. What's the legacy you're leaving for the whiskey and bourbon world? Well, whatever I've done in the past, but also um, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm becoming, I'm more ambassadorial and really going out and training and educating people about our products. And so that to me is just as important, but also that, you know, for me to do this, I've had to train people. I had to make sure the systems are in place so that I can do this. And so a lot of people don't think a lot about that, but I've thought a tremendous about, it, and I've done a lot of work on that so that you have the systems in place so I can do this. So I can come and talk to you. I can come and do events. I can do all these things because I know for a fact that everything will be fine back at, at Buffalo Trace in Sazerac. And so I think that will be, I think that's anybody's biggest legacy you can leave is for that continuity, you know, to take over something 20 years ago at Buffalo Trace and make it a little bit better for the next person. I think you can't say any more than that. That's really what it's about. There are still people entering the whiskey world all the time. Oh yeah. With that hesitation of they don't know where to start or that they don't want to look like they don't know what they're talking about. Where would you, if somebody were to say, Drew, where should I start in whiskey? What, what should be that entrance point for me to learn and explore and experience? Well, that's easy. <laughs> that's, you start at the bottom. <laughs> you learn about everything. I went through, you know, it, I was very fortunate to start with Seagram's, which I think at the time was world class training for uh, in any distillery that even after Seagram was gone it was sold um, the people that worked for Seagram were all spread out through the industry uh, to different organizations whether it be you know Four Roses um, Lawrenceburg whatever wherever they were there were former Seagram people so the training that they did at Seagram was unbelievable so I, you know, you got to learn, you got to start from the bottom. You got to learn. I was very fortunate to have exposure to a lot of different things at Seagram. And that's the way they train people. You just didn't focus on one area and be kind of a silo. You actually, you know, went to different areas of that organization and learned different things. So that ultimately, if you become somebody like a master blender or a, a plant manager, whatever you become, you'll have a really good background, understand the whole process. So I, I would think the younger people should understand the whole process and get much as experience as you can because I think that really pays dividends down the road. You prefer on the rocks or neat when going out? Oh, neat. And is there a cocktail you're drinking now? No, I don't drink too many cocktails. Other than when I do events, I, I always like to taste the cocktail that they're serving so I know what people are drinking. But I prefer not to drink and I, you know, that's just a personal preference because a lot of people do like cocktails. Uh, and if you like cocktails, go for it. Well, you, mes you mentioned Sazerac as, as making a, <laughs> you know, I mean, th that's there. And I'm always curious because as you're out and about, you're seeing people make these incredible cocktails. And you're like, mm -hmm. all right, I didn't think of making that with our product or this product. But that is right on and that's delicious. And we'll just start making that one. And that will be our to go cocktail all the time for a while. But I think it sounds like that also, you like to keep your palate fresh yeah. and be able to experience the whiskey itself, the oh, bourbon yes. itself, right? Yeah, if I have, sometimes I'm asked to create a cocktail and I always tend to always over pour whatever bourbon they're using because I want to taste the whiskey. I don't want to taste all sweetness. I want to taste the whiskey. Unfortunately, that's just me. Maybe it's not everybody. Uh, so I'll ask them to cut back if they're adding sugar or I'll ask them to substitute something just to knock that down or pour more bourbon in and make that. That's the way I would enjoy it. And uh, 
Unfortunately, most people don't do that. As a master blender, yeah. as you're experimenting, you're always keeping in mind as to how you're going to exceed your customer's expectations. How do you seek to do that? That's really a hard question because you have to put your mind into the customer's mind, which is impossible. So you, you'll never be 100% right. So what I found over the years is my palate and my taste, I understand what people like. I can predict what people like just because, not that I'm special, it's just that I have the experience because I know what pe people tend to like in terms of taste. And so it's really your palate. I, I would make the decision, but a lot of times it's the marketing uh, team who will make the decision. And you can recommend, but they're the ones ultimately responsible for the customer's uh, choice. You talk about those experiences or those experiments that you've come across. You failed at many to get to one yes. of those great... Yes. But, but what have been some of those aha moments along the way in your career that you stop and say, you know what? I'm good at this and I like what I do. And you're amazed at some of the things that you've had a chance to, in the lab, put together. What are some of those aha moments? Well, probably um, the learnings are, are aha moments. Like, for instance, um, you know, we do lots of experiments, like I said. So, so we traditionally put in products at a certain proof in the barrel. Um, what we found out is, oh, let's try putting it in lower. You can't put it in more than 125 to be officially bourbon. But you put it lower, and then you, after so many years, and it takes a long time because you have to age it. So say you look at eight years later, that experiment. And so you have one that, and probably the best example is wheat. Because everybody thinks, oh, it's got to be very low proof to be a great wheat. So we did that experiment. And so when it went in, we put it in at 114 proof. And you can put it down to you know, it's whatever you want. Uh, so we put it down in stages of five or something proof points. And basically we found that the way, the way we currently have it, it tastes great. In other words, 114 proof is great. But the lower ones are less mature, less developed, and it wouldn't be acceptable. But that was uh, the aha moment to me is that that seems obvious, well, you wouldn't make it this way, but then you have to ask yourself other questions like, well, what happens if you age it much longer? What would happen? So, you know, where a typical wheat maybe at 30 years old wouldn't be very good in terms of taste, maybe the lower proof ones will switch now and become the best. So the moment for me is that the experiment answers a question, but it take it, it you have 10 more questions after the experiment. And I think that's the biggest learning that I've had over this whole experimental program is that we learn, yes, we learn, but we have many more questions afterwards. Do you have another last drop in the works? Uh, yes. Good. But I'm not telling you where it's from. Yeah, see, I got them. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just working, uh, actually last week, and it's not Buffalo Trace. That brings to mind a question, because looking at some of your work as a master blender, that last drop seems to get a lot of attention, and that's why I was curious. And how do you feel about the secondary market or the resale market of the products that either you've created or just overall in 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 the whiskey world well the last drop is certainly um i think it's very prestigious and uh very you know it's pretty expensive but they're they're extremely rare products and not only are they rare they're remarkable so our criteria is twofold not just to be rare but to be remarkable and that last comment remarkable is really the, the sticking point differentiates us is that you can have a rare product doesn't mean it's going to taste good so we probably we you know we look at like with Rebecca we look at 
and she's the managing director, we look at hundreds of samples and probably 99% or more are not approved. And, but there's once in a while we'll come across one of those that are not only rare but remarkable. And so that, that whole brand is all about that. So that's really important. And what was the second part of your question? Honestly, you got me at remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> because in my head, I'm thinking about the inventory. And you said it's not a Buffalo Trace product. It may be coming from another distillery it, it will, in the Sazerac yes. Or, um, or elsewhere. Or elsewhere. Which is what we do. We have lots of scotch. So so we, we've been buying these products, but there's less and less available because a lot of companies know the value now and they're actually doing their own thing. So we've been gradually transitioning to putting away our own products, not just Sazeracs, but buying products and putting them away for the future long term. I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. So we're going to not only uh, and not only uh, buy products, but also make our own products for the future. And we really are, have made a lot of progress in that area. So not only curate these products, but also now create our own. And that's part of what I did with my blend uh, number 28 is make something that's re truly remarkable, at least try to, and uh, rare. And so I used the rarest components I could find, which is what I've been putting away for years. The question that was the second part of that was your perspective on the secondary market, the resale oh, right, market right. of bottles. So that's really uh, something that we totally are disgusted in because we do not want people to be paying that kind of price. Because a lot of people come up to me in some of these events that we're doing and say, why, why don't you charge more so you get rid of that secondary market? But that's not our plan. Our plan is to make something, products that are affordable, and we want to build brands. You know, we don't want to destroy the brand. Um, but the secondary market is very negative, I think, and we want people to buy our products and enjoy them and taste them, not to save them, to sell them in the secondary. So we're totally against that, and so am I. We're here at Roger Wilco yes. in Pensacola, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Jamie R. Kang was uh, gracious enough to bring us all together. So which four expressions are you bringing tonight, or which four expressions have you brought tonight for the well, Wilco whiskey to try? Yes, we've got the Traveler, which is brand new, hot off the market. It's hard to get. It's a collaboration with uh, Buffalo Trace and our distiller Harlan Wheatley with uh, Chris Stapleton, who's... I hear pretty famous in the country uh, singing part, and uh, it's selling like hotcakes. So that'll be fun. Everybody try something new, and uh, we're trying uh, Rock Hill Farms, Elmer T. Lee, and uh, Pappy Van Winkle. So we've got a good slate, a variety of things for people to try tonight. So we're looking forward to that. Senior member of the American Society <laughs> for Quality. Yeah, I'm old. What? specifically are your responsibilities or what what does that entail nobody's ever asked me that question before but it was really uh, my whole intent goes back to Seagram when I was with Seagram I wanted to become you know you try to make yourself the most valuable pl player on the field so that you can get up to where you want to go so uh, I took a lot of courses in quality and I actually became Back in the 80s, it, was, it was, wasn't was was a lot of people that are certified, but I'm a certified quality engineer. So that gave me that little extra boost. So if they're looking for somebody in the quality area, which Seagram quality was synonymous with blending and all about the aging process because it was all one group. And so that made me very, you know, I think important in, in terms of uh, skill set. Uh, so people looked at me and it got me actually to move from that site to our Montreal site, which was our head office at Seagram's for quality and blending. And so certified quality engineer with the ASQ, but also now since I've been doing this for so long, since the 80s, I'm a senior. So that's what that means. But really gives you the skills and quality. So, you know, quality is not blending. But it's still the same thing because you're still the quality of the product, the consistency of the product. And so that's what got me into that quality piece, become certified with that American Society for Quality. 
and I still still to this day we we still attend the quality uh, conference every year to keep abreast of the current concepts of quality and, and I don't have to for my job now but it's so interesting for me I think it's a value that's important to you. It is. And it comes out to what you do every day as a master blender. Yeah. Training the people that are working alongside of you, the future yeah. of those that will continue on the legacy. And to me, if that would summarize a lot of who you are, mm -hmm. quality to me is a focal point of, of the definition of who Drew Mabel is. Yes. And it fits very well with Sazerac. Because... It's all about the quality and the taste of the product. And, you know, I can give you counts of, countless examples of how that works every day at Sazerac. Is there anything we haven't talked about today on the podcast? Anything you want our listeners to know more about you, Sazerac, Buffalo Trace, or, you know, what you ate for lunch today? I don't know. <laughs> A salad. Of okay, of course. <laughs> no, I just enjoy all spirit types. Um, everybody thinks that... Uh, they tend to associate me with just bourbon, but I also do other products. So I blend, we have a scotch that I blended that's excellent scotch. It's a 12 year old scotch. I blend rums. Uh, we have a lot of different rum categories, like a lot of different rum brands that we've introduced lately. Um, Irish whiskey, Canadian whiskey. So people associate me with just bourbon because I'm at Buffalo Trace physically, but I also get involved with all Sazerac distilleries, which is really a lot of fun for me because it gives me that, that diversity that I had at Seagram. And that's one of the reasons I think that I was appealing to Sazerac because of that diversity versus just uh, bourbon and whiskey. True. Thank you for your time today. You're welcome. I am grateful for this experience. Dawn and I uh, just have shared our experience when we first met you at Sazerac and leading up to today. Thanks for being a friend of Fermented Adventure. And we can't wait to do the You're tasting welcome. later and um, see what's coming as, Ooh, as many offerings. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.